committee for Cooper County Fund. And I'd like to welcome you all to our second 2020 uh, vision. <coughs> vision. We have one more next week. I don't think your microphone is uh, Hello? Uh, 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 um, we have one more convening next week that will be on education. And uh, our speaker will be Devil Gist. Uh, so, today we will be focusing on energy in the environment. And this has been, been a long time collaboration or partnership with the Daily News. And this time it's been a collaboration. And I really want to thank Sheila. Uh, it was really her idea for these convenings. And we have to give credit where credit is due. Thank you very much. And, and along with our good friend, George Patello from the Newport County Fund. Um, well, convenings are an important, are an opportunity for the community to come together to discuss issues of county-wide interest. It's an important way for the Newport County Fund to fulfill its mission to improve the quality of life across Newport County. 2020 vision is a result of collaboration among a number of local organizations. We'd like to thank South River Regina University for providing the use of the Health Center, Putnick Island Planning Commission, and Tina Dalton, Secured Services of VHB, who are providing technology and staffing for electronic holding, Van Buren Charitable Foundation for their support to incorporate an attractive interactive voting element in the series. And others who help to conceptualize and plan the programs are Newport County Chamber of Commerce, Newport and Bristol County Convention and Visitors Bureau, and Newport Publication, Public Education Foundation. And I know we have an advisor from Newport County Fund. I go for an avenue for little comment. Thank you for coming up and June Gibbs. Just walked in the door, it's another advisor. <laughs> and now I'd like to introduce Sheila Brown, executive editor of Newport Daily News, and she has the rest of the program. Thank you. Thank you, Bill, and I would like to echo Bill's um, comments and thank all of you for being here. Um, we did have more people than are here signed up, but we want to get the program started and hopefully the thunderstorms won't keep them all from coming and participating in our forum tonight. We do feel that um, it, it's an important opportunity for the community to talk about some of the important issues that are facing the state as well as the county um, to, to get together to discuss these um, issues, to break them down, to um, talk about them to help us um, as the Newport Daily News and also the organizations that are co-sponsoring this and supporting this effort get a sense of what the community wants which is particularly important to the Daily News as we head into the general election in November and we'll be using the comments that um, and the priorities that are articulated during these forums to help us set our agenda um, and I think it's something that all of the organizations that have been involved in the planning have felt um, is an, an important opportunity. And we'd also like to just echo the thanks to Salve, Regina, for allowing us to use the Pell Center, which more than one person has said is a great venue for this kind of community brainstorming activity. Um, and it's great to have them as a partner in this. Um, we're really excited. We, we started off last week with the economy and had Keith Stokes, the director of the Economic Development Corporation, talk about some things that are going on at the statewide level, as well as some projects that are being eyed and, and worked on in the Newport County level. And this, um, tonight, we're very fortunate um, as we're developing a conversation around the topic of energy and environment to have Kenneth Payne, who's the administrator of the Office of Energy Resources for Rhode Island, join us tonight to talk about some of the things that are going on at the state level, as well as maybe some of the things that we can be expecting to see in Newport County. And I, I do love this description, so I'm going to use it. 
Um, he has been called one of Rhode Island's most esteemed and witty energy policy wonks. So we hope that you'll live up to that for us tonight, and we really appreciate you being here. Thank you for having me uh, down. It was um, a thrill to get this invitation. I have to grind it out um, so often, so much, so many hours a day, um, long, long, tedious days of just grinding out programs, rules and regulations, trying to make systems of government work, that the opportunity to stand back and think about the bigger picture was so welcome and so refreshing that um, I'm quite indebted to you for being here because if you weren't here, the sponsors would have said, eh, cancel, um, and to the sponsors for inviting me. So thank you all very much. Um, I'll be talking really about, um, I have sort of three areas I want to touch on. Um, and the first is really, the relationship of energy to the economy. Secondly, I want to think about um, environmental issues in a community context. And thirdly, I want to have a couple of remarks about planning and its uh, crucial importance going forward. Um, so that's what I'm going to cover. Um, now, for me to be in some place uh, sort of dedicated to Claiborne Powell is especially poignant because I worked for him as his projects coordinator for the last eight and a half years of his service in the United States Senate. And he said that our job was to turn ideas into actions that help people. That was our job description. And once he said that, I said, that's a tremendous challenge, but just the right one. And the topics of this series, I know from my experience with the senator, would be dear to his heart, thus your presence here in a place um, honoring him and carrying on his legacy is especially appropriate. Uh, energy and the economy. Every, every economic era is shaped by how energy is obtained and used. Every economic era is shaped by how energy is obtained and used. Think about Newport. Newport, in its heyday, had an energy economy. It was the 18th century. It was before steam had taken off and changed the world. The energy economy of Newport was muscles and wind. Muscles and wind. Now, because when you ran a mill, you had very often a horse moving around the millstone, grinding the stuff that was more important than trying to use people. If you think about one of the darkest stains on Rhode Island history and Newport history, slavery. Slavery is simply importing the muscle power to fuel an economy. It was an energy equation with radical moral complexities ultimately associated with it. So think of how this city, with its reliance on you know, good wind and the ability to sail to Europe and to sail south, how energy shaped the formation of this community. It was in an agricultural land. By New England standards, these are excellent agricultural soils on a Quidnick Island and through South South County, and you produce food, which if you have a, an energy economy that's heavily reliant on mussels, 
food becomes rather exceedingly important. Then if you think about Newport's Gilded Age, those fortunes are only imaginable in the context of a coal and steam economy. Coal and steam economy. You know, Newport sort of become more of an ornament during the period of what I will call the petroleum economy. Um, and as we move to uh, large scale mass production and those sorts of things. But we all know that that economy, that large scale mass production economy, has been largely exported from the United States. And we're confronted by another set of economic opportunities. And to believe for a moment that we're simply going to return to the way things were, I think there's no reasonable basis to assume that's going to happen. So as we emerge towards a next economy, you may reasonably ask yourself, how will energy shape it? Because energy will. How we obtain and use energy, including in this community, will shape the economic future of this community. I just thought offer that as kind of a provocative idea. But well, your job is to challenge it, to think about it and say, that rascal Payne was actually uh, a damnable fellow, and I don't like what he was saying. That's a very healthy and healthy response. But at least that's um, a good starting point. Um, my, my function here, I think, is to be provocative. OK, moving on to the next thing. Let's talk about our relationship to energy. What's our relationship to energy? Hmm. The first, your first relationship to energy is your food. You know, it's what you eat. And if, you, if you'll say, oh, I'm out of energy, sometimes that means you're hungry. So when you look at your grocery store, think about that as an energy purveyor. Calories are a measurement of energy. They also are something that you want to kind of control because you worry about diets. But the calories are a, a measure of energy. So that's our first um, relationship to energy is our food. Um, I'm not disappointed in this, but I will notice that no one here is naked. <laughs> <laughs> Since I kind of come from a, a Yankee background, if there was a house, it would probably frighten me. Uh, so our second relationship with energy is our clothing. Our clothing is actually our personal insulation. This is enormously important. Um, my wife and I were building, were building a house. It goes back to 2005. And we started to look at magazines about building houses. And in these magazines, I realized that um, most of the uh, women's in the advertisements were posing in the houses for very modestly clad. <laughs> Often barefoot, right? You can, you can conjure up the images. Right? You, you can bring them to your mind. Well, that means you have to heat the vast amounts of space <laughs> in order to be comfortable for someone who wants to um, be wearing nothing. I think, uh, and that's the image we pre present of what's appropriate um, uh, kinds of clothing that we should heat our spaces so people can dress very lightly, even when it's bitterly cold out. Um, so think about, just as a test, um, I, I looked at the relationship between schools of architecture and schools of fashion design, wondering if I could conquer this problem by saying, why don't you align architecture and fashion design in order to um, 
get to make some progress around things. And RISD, RISD in fact turned out to be the highest standing institution that had both architecture and uh, fashion design. So I cornered the president of RISD at a cocktail party and with Roger and I, and I said, Roger, I got something really great. <laughs> Well, he thought I was from Mars, right? <laughs> like, what, what are you talking about? But nevertheless, think about the relationship between style, which drives so much of human behavior, and um, fashion and energy and those kinds of things. That's so quite closely related. And so that if we could make um, the insulating properties of clothing more exciting to the taste, we could actually solve energy problems. <laughs> um, one of the things I tried to do in um, running energy programs for low-income households is um, make sure you can give the households good blankets, wool blankets. Uh, that's an energy need. So if you have um, uh, and your first relation, your food, your second relation, your clothing, your third relationship, your residence, then you have your, um, uh, your energy use in your mobility, and then in the way you're economically productive. Those are kinds of the ways in which we as people use energy, and we have to think about it in those terms if we're going to make progress on it. What you recognize, if you look at it that way, is it's a very personal set of things. It's personal and community. Um, I often think that, um, um, how is it? People said, oh, Ken, you're going to be the next energy czar. Right? That's what they, I was, when I took my job, they said, you're going to be an energy czar. I said, oh, I have no aspiration to be like, um, uh, Russian aristocracy from a bygone era, right? I do not have, what my, I said, no, I don't want to be an energy humanist. I don't want to have programs work for people. I'm interested in what people want to do to address their energy situations. And as I get into the more nitty gritty, you'll see that there's a pattern of what we're trying to do in the um, energy office. It's very people oriented and very community oriented. Let me go through that with you briefly. First of all, the way you produce change in behavior is that people can see other ways of doing it. In other words, it's sort of clear, they can understand it. They're an understandable. And if their neighbors are doing it, then people will adopt different behaviors. So if we want to make progress, around energy issues, it has to be clear what to do. Uh, it has to be understandable. You can't make it, you can have something clear but complex. and say, yeah, I can see it, but I can't figure it out. Um, and then you have to be able to validate it with, um, uh, by have seen it outside of the community. If you can see something in your own community, you can say, well, I know my neighbor really isn't that much smarter than I am. Uh, and if my neighbor, who is actually somewhat dumber than I am, can do it, I can do it too. And if it's part of the um, spirit of the community, then it becomes something you do in the community. So rather than just concentrate on big ticket responses to energy, which many people do. It's sort of like top energy comes from the top down, and what we have to do is be um, servile, and some great corporation is going to solve our problems for us. That's kind of what people say is energy policy is all about. Build something very big, and that will solve the problem. Uh, build something very big and very clean. Well. What we've done is we're trying to put money into every single community in the state. 
Unlike other jurisdictions, when we got the federal our funds, they said put it all up to competition and let the best win. I said, I'm going to design programs so I can get funding into every community in Rhode Island. I'm going to try to do stuff more at the small scale than at the large scale. I'm going to have uh, programs of, um, for energy efficiency that are as broad based as possible. Uh, I could go through statutory citations and say, well, you have to look at 391.2-2, um, uh, and I can do all those kinds of things for you, which if you're curious about them, I shall. But let's say that Rhode Island has the potential of being a national leader on energy efficiency. And energy efficiency is something that people do and communities do. And it's much less expensive than buying energy from any source. So if you can get something for three cents a kilowatt hour, I'm just doing ratios, three cents a kilowatt hour for efficiency, it costs you 10 cents a kilowatt hour to buy it. And if you go out into the renewables market, it's much higher than that. I'm not disparaging renewables. I look upon my job as creating space for renewables by increasing the level of efficiency. Let's look at this societally. The cost of energy is the price times the use. Price times use equals cost. We all experience this. Okay. So let's say we see that um, traditional forms of energy, like coal-fired electric generation facilities, have a lot of environmental externalities that are very unpleasant for us. We don't like them. We don't like the um, greenhouse gases. We want to do that. At least in the near term, renewables are more expensive than traditional. So we say, OK, we could have a price shock if we went to renewables. But what if you, at the same time, had an aggressive policy around energy efficiency? So you're saying, we're going to put most of our effort into energy efficiency. Um, and that will create space so that you can have renewables without driving up overall societal costs. So that's the strategy. Now, uh, when I, I'm given pretty good opportunity to work on these things, right? But everybody says the sexy thing is renewables because it's highly visible and it gets you stories and you can talk about building industry. Well, there are economies that say, we're never going to have cheap energy. Therefore, we have to be highly efficient. And so why don't we uh, try to be a high efficiency economy rather than a low cost, uh, high energy user economy? I will submit to you that um, it is very unlikely that Rhode Island will ever have the energy profile of Texas. We can't emulate the Texans. They have their own strategies. They won't work here. We're much more likely to have an energy profile similar to a European country, similar to Japan, places that are actually quite economically successful. And they don't do it by saying, the only way out is low cost energy. They say, what we have to do is, if it's precious, we have to use it. <coughs> so this becomes a very interesting thing. Furthermore, if you use it efficiently, it doesn't pollute. And you're not using as much of it. So one of our goals is really around giving the 
broadest level of opportunity that we can think of for um, energy efficiency. That's um, uh, what our office does more of and um, does it uh, by making some really, really, really hard choices. Now let me give you an example. Um, and it's painful, but why not be why not be level with it? Okay. The chronic unemployment in Rhode Island is increasing the level of utility shutoffs. And there is a correlation between utility shutoffs and households needing assistance with their energy bills. That's a reality. So I'm seeing an increase in demand. I'm seeing an increase in demand for energy assistance for low-income households to get through this year. That's part of my reality. Here's a four. We depend on the federal government for the funding. At best, we'll be level funded this year. That's best. A more likely scenario is we'll drop between 20% and 30%. Probably, I hope, the 20% number. We don't know. And furthermore, we're not going to see uh, the bill pack that through Congress until after the election. So after the beginning of the So I'm faced, and this is my job, when I talk about being a grinding bureaucrat, to try to weigh out how you manage that. How do you manage a declining level of ability to provide assistance against an increasing demand for assistance because of the condition of the economy? That's one of my realities. And one of the things I try to do is increase the level of weatherization of homes. In um, two years ago, 2008, we were averaging weatherizing low-income households at a rate of about 93 a month. Last year, uh, we got it up to 130 a month. This year, we're well over 160 a month. So in a period uh, of a short period now, money I'm putting into weatherization of households is money I can't spend on subsidizing energy bills of the same households. The answer to that households long-term need is to get things weatherized. That's the reality. Let's put it this way. If you have a household that has an $1,800 uh, uh, dollar a year energy bill and an ability if it's got $10,000 income to put $600 towards energy. And if we can come up on the public side with $600 to help with energy bills, we've got $1,200 that's available. If the energy bill is $1,800, there's all, it's very difficult to bridge the difference. I'm giving sort of real ball, ballpark numbers. The way but households don't have to use that much energy if there's efficiency. So the long-term answer is to increase efficiency. But there's a question of funding that I can raise for you. So one of the things I'm not going to do unless it's necessary is reduce the commitment to energy efficiency because that's the long-term answer. I coined a phrase, I, I had a stack, you know, when you're a bureaucrat, you get to have stack meetings. And I, and, I, and I kind of worry about life a lot, so I, I don't sleep too well, and I um, get up early and I work, work, work. And as I got up one morning, uh, well, exactly a week ago, it was about last year, last Thursday, I had my stack meeting. And I go into my staff meeting, as, as bosses want to do, and make some grand pronouncement. And I said, I've got a new motto for the office. And my motto was, 
Cannibalism is not the answer to starvation. Yeah, I, I had the editor laughing. I didn't know I was a cannibal. But, but what do you want? I, what do you want? Oh, that's a horrible line. Okay, uh, so, so we can't eat up our future. We can't cannibalize our future just to survive at home. We're going to have some tough times around this stuff. So now let's look at community issues. Because I've sort of given you a sense of where I am. I, I, my current throughput, just for your sort of sense of proportion, is I run about um, uh, 60 plus dollars per capita per year right now for my office. So for $60 per capita, that's about what I'm running right now. I oversee stuff that has a, 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 a bigger um, range than even that, but dollars I can get my hands on are about $60 per capita. Um, anyway, communities. We can't solve these problems by thinking every community is identical. Everything is very contextual. The way in which you have settlement patterns, the way you have community infrastructure, all those things make an enormous amount of difference about the opportunities you have present. If I were just to use renewable energy as an example, you will not do low head hydro here. You can't do it in Newport County because you have no water that falls in to energy. In Pawtucket, you can do it because you have a Blackstone coming down. You can't do wind energy. In Pawtucket, you can do it on Quidnick Island. You have different soils, so your opportunity to grow things is different. And that's highly varied even in Rhode Island. Settlement patterns are actually somewhat different. You have the embedded energy value uh, of, of existing buildings. So you have to think about this personal relationship of energy in terms of your own community. And as you think about energy issues, know that more than anything else out there, they have a profound effect on the quality of the natural and built environment. I was billed as talking about energy and the environment and in a way, I am. Because when you get right down to it, how we use energy affects our natural environment more profoundly than just about anything else we do. Uh, the largest energy user in most jurisdictions are the water supply company and your wastewater treatment. The biggest user of energy in Warwick is the Warwick Wastewater Treatment Plant. Energy fund fuels cleaning up water quality problems. One of the less exciting things that I'm trying to do is figure out a way so Rhode Island can be the premier jurisdiction in the nation and having high energy efficiency and wastewater treatment plants. You know, people say, what do you want to do? Make energy investments in, in um, dealing with sewage? Well, that's where the big problem is. And so, and furthermore, if you get it right, you actually get better water effluent. You get better effluent now. So, that's one of those goals. Not an exciting one but enormously important. So if we do a good job in thinking about how we be more energy efficient, we look at big energy users in our own community, you say, wastewater treatment, there it is. Let's think about it. Now to my um, uh, concluding observations, which are about the plan. Somewhere along the line, probably around right after the First World War. Planning was captured as a means to rationalize governmental activity. 
It was part of industrial culture. And it became a basis for regulation. They said, oh, you should regulate according to a plan. You should develop according to a plan. Planning became attached to regulation. And then it got a bad name because people also said, oh, we don't like regulation and we don't like communism. And the communists talk in terms of having plans. So if they talk in terms of having plans, maybe we should dispense with planning. And so those who were uneasy with the notion of regulation and those who were uneasy with the notion of communism, well, but the magic of planning is actually the communication that takes place as people prepare plans and come up with designs. Because in that sharing ideas, putting everything together, they actually produce deeper understanding of what's going on in a place at a point in time than any of them had before they began that effort. And the marvelous thing about planning is its educative value for those who are participating. It's absolutely a superb thing to do. And you don't have to convert it into regulations or a draconian economic system in order to enjoy its pleasures. So to uh, the aspirations of this series sponsors, which are to get you together to think about issues, and to engage in what I will um, call communicative action, you know, uh, sort of a Habermasian notion of communicative action. So I want to um, once again say they're doing the right thing I really appreciate them asking me to come down and share some uh, thoughts with you. Um, I didn't ask you to memorize a lot of specifics. I hope you go away with some sense of what the broad picture of is and how uh, energy is very much our responsibility and not just something that we will have other people do to us. So thank you very much. Have a good time with your breakouts. I'm going to hang in throughout and look forward to it. And uh, I'll turn it back over to your host. Uh, as uh, Mr. Payne noted, and as anybody who's here, how many people here from the last session? Were at the last session? So people who were here at the last session um, who can help um, guide this process. Um, what we'd like to do now is to break into smaller sessions that will be facilitated and you can discuss some subtopics that the organizers of the series have um, um, developed through our conversations, but certainly based on what you're hearing here tonight and some of the provocative things and very interesting things that you've heard, certainly feel free to take those um, discussions in whatever direction. Um, your facilitator lets you. You should all have um, a card with a number on it. Um, and I know I always have to ask, do you know what rooms people are? Is this uh, room one? This room will be uh, folks for uh, group number one.